Can you talk about how you approach the working with non-professional actors? Well, the 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 biggest thing to confront, I think, if you're going to work with non-professionals, is um, if there's a way to not have to have them memorize lines that you're you're heading in the right direction. That's what locks them up when they're having to sort of speak somebody else's words. And so what we tried to do here um, was give them give them the premise of the scene and, and a list of things that we would like them to talk about, but let them do it in their own way. Did you were, uh, shoot multiple cameras in, in some We ways? were shooting usually usually two cameras and in a couple instances that I'll, I'll point out, three cameras. And that, I think, is also a must. And also sort of keeping the... The, the reason the, the film has this sort of... Uh, feeling of a succession of tableaus is because I didn't ever want them to be in a situation where they had to hit marks or they felt they couldn't move one way or another because that was another way I thought that would make them un that would make them uncomfortable or I felt it would. So the whole style of the film emerged from making non-professional actors do their best possible exactly. work. Exactly. Yeah. So and so did you just did you tend to use first takes, meaning that that's when they were the most spontaneous? Or yeah, I mean, what would the second take be like? They were well, they were they were pretty great right away, and so I tended to to want to use the first or the second take. We rarely went more than two takes, only if there was a technical problem, um, and you could feel if you got into a fifth or a sixth take, you could you could feel things start to shift a They're little bit. They're starting to act. Yeah, it just got different. Or, yeah. uh, or maybe they felt they weren't doing enough, you know, or they or they were being boring. Or Yeah, it would start to shift a little bit. But fortunately, we were usually two or three takes and we were we were done. Well, certainly, I, I was I, I was always willing to bend the movie to fit them. Mm -hmm. You know, and and I I never wanted to be in a situation where I was telling them I need you to I need you to act this way I need you to behave. So this did the, way. the the process did the plot take any chain uh, make any you know detours based on that? No, not really. So but what was what's an example of the you know having to take uh, the lead of the actor's comfort or the, or so that something changed from your original plan? Well, I don't more often than not, what would happen is that, um, for instance, in the scene that comes later with Debbie where she's being Martha, the character Martha is being interrogated by the cop, um, I had tried as much as possible to shoot the film in sequence, and I had tried to not give them more information than they needed. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, they they knew the basic set up of the movie and we had this this little outline that we were working from but they they were really great about not not wanting to know too far ahead what what was coming mm -hmm. and you know for instance the uh, I think we got really lucky in one in one case Martha's house um, was owned by this gentleman named Omar and when we went to scout Martha's house, Omar was there in his lounge chair, and um, I turned to Greg, my producer, and I said, well, that's Martha's dad. We've got to get Omar to play Martha's dad. He's perfect. Mm -hmm. And his reaction later in the film when the detective comes by and tells him what's happened to Martha, I thought was just one of those instances where you can't, you're not going to sit here and tell Omar to, to have some huge response. Uh, he understood completely what was going on. Well, it feels totally authentic. It and, feels like you know, uh, people are in shock initially. They don't necessarily emote. You know? No, exactly. And also, I think that generation and somebody living in those circumstances, um, it seemed to me a, a really a really interesting uh, way to respond to news like that. But I think, you know, Debbie and Dusty and Dustin and Misty, excuse me. Um, their reference points are not 
acting class. They're not other movies. They're just it's just their life. That's mm-hmm. the only thing they have uh, to sort of refer to. And I think in that case, even when it's um, not as as overtly dramatic as what you see in a normal film, it it takes on its own thing as the movie plays out. Well, they're not having emotions for the audience, you know. In this way, I feel like I felt like I was more engaged emotionally with this film, which some people would argue is sort of emotionally flattened on screen. But I, you know, I got very wrapped up in it because I feel like I wasn't. I was just participating uh, emotionally in it, as opposed to just having all the emotions play out for me. So it's sort of like some alchemy where. The more f- emotionally flat it may seem doesn't necessarily mean you're not going to become engaged. But do you think that's a? I think that's a. I think you're right, and I think that's you sort probably of lean a, forward emotionally. But I, I clearly, most watching people it. that go to movies like to see, you know, stuff coming at them a little well, more. Well, this is not a necessarily a movie for a gigantic mass audience. This is a you know specialized film that's. Um, I think it's a, an exquisite film, but it certainly it certainly doesn't con, you know doesn't have all the tropes that we're used to, and that's what I think makes it great. Well, let's talk for a bit. I mean, I could talk endlessly actually about the process of casting these actors and working with these actors and how you discovered them. Actually, let's talk not endlessly, but just briefly about that before I wanted to ask you about all the technical stuff about making the film. Well, what we did was after. Coleman and I finished the outline. We sent our casting director, Carmen Cuba, uh, to Parkersburg with with a pretty specific uh, description of what we were looking for. And she spent a, a few weeks there walking around, talking to people. And when she spotted somebody that she felt fit the, the description, she would say, would you come down and be interviewed on camera about this movie? Uh, and She did this in Belle Prey? Yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. And so that's how, uh, that's how we cast the film, is based on these, these sort of half-hour interviews that she did, in which she would talk to them about their lives, not about the movie. She would just ask them questions about who they were and what their background was. Um, and Debbie Doberiner, who plays Martha... Carmen found when she was uh, at the drive through at a KFC and she heard this woman talking uh, to these younger employees, explaining to them uh, that they weren't following, I guess, a certain procedure the way that she felt it should be followed. And Carmen just heard this woman talking and leaned over and saw Debbie uh, and pulled out of the drive through lane and parked and went in and said, you have to come in and interview with us and as soon as Coleman and I saw that interview we thought that's that's she's great like her that she just has the most amazing face well the whole cast is really perfectly balanced and perfectly selected because they're all charismatic enough to keep your interest and they're photogenic and they're um they're all uh you know interesting versions of the type that you required and yet they're not so charismatic or so photogenic that that they they look like you know movie actors they 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 look like real people and why do you think why do you think we've gotten in general so far away from people on screen looking like the rest of the country well i think in in independent movies we still see that we still see the philip seymour hoffman's and the John C. Riley's in this, you know, but uh, I don't know why that is. Do you think, I mean, do people, is the the, the sense that audiences don't want to see people who look like real people or or is somebody making that up? Uh, I mean, I don't know. I haven't really thought about it. I think that there's, you know, this obsession with physical appearance in this country and, and it sort of sets the bar so high that if you're not some mega human like Brad Pitt or, George Clooney or, you know, that somehow... All the people I work with, is that what you're saying? Well, coincidentally. <laughs> now, that that actually segues into another topic which I'm interested in, which is you've periodically gone from very elaborate studio productions, costly studio productions with big movie stars, and then you've seemed to have taken a, a left turn and, and, and felt a desire to work on a much smaller scale. This seems 
one of the most kind of profound shifts to go from, I believe you went from Ocean's 12 to this. Talk about that shift, and then also talk about coming back. Like, uh, I visited you on the set of The Good German, which is the new film you're making, and what I saw was, at least what I saw anyway, you shooting was extremely simple and actually seemed somewhat akin to some of the scenes in this film. How did coming back again from after making Bubble Effect, how you work? I It may be just the... Uh the creative equivalent of the grass is greener you know when i find when i'm working on something like the oceans films which i enjoy um part of me is in the middle of it saying oh god i would love to be on a movie with a 12 person crew that would be so nice um and so I, instead of just wishing about it, what I try and do is to, is to take concrete steps to make sure that I am able to go and do that. Um, and then when I'm making uh, a film like Bubble, what I find is not so much like, oh, I miss the toys or I miss the bigger uh, aspects of you know studio production, but it's, it's more trying to find, I feel like, I'm trying to find ways to bring the bubble type experience to some of the larger films. Like I feel there's there's got to be things I can take from the small the smaller movies that will benefit the process of making a bigger film. And so, what would be an example of that? Well, even uh, as you were saying, even on a film like The Good German, trying to um, really analyze everything. And determine, well, how many people do we need, really? And what kind of stuff, you know, like, how elaborate does this have to be? I mean, The Good German's a movie in which basically all the money is going into the art department, literally. And so once you understand that, and you can look at, you can start to sit down and say, how do we, how can we strip this down a little and make it smaller? I don't know. I, I've never, I've never felt inhibited by the scale of anything I've made, but it's certainly... When you're working on oceans and you feel like you've got 110 people tethered to your belt, your 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 ability to make a radical left turn creatively is is definitely you know. Do you find that there's resistance to the idea from producers? No, you just, about no, you just know that the the fallout if you're wrong is going to be more significant than it than it will be on a movie like Bubble, and so you just have to. You have to think things through a little more, which on a movie like Bubble, you can literally just follow any little creative tributary you feel like you want to follow. And you know that the consequences are, are minimal if you're wrong, if you've gone down a wrong path.